In ancient Greece, the treatment of disease was based more on philosophy than in genuine understanding of human anatomy. Surgical procedures were rare, and human dissection was not an accepted practice. As a result, physicians had little first-hand information about the inside of the human body. It wasn't until the Renaissance that the science of human anatomy was born. A Belgian physician, Andreas Vesalius, shocked many by deciding to investigate anatomy by dissecting human bodies. Bodies that he was often forced to procure under cover of night. For medical students like Vesalius who wanted to dissect, they had to just find bodies from outside of the legal channels. Once Vesalius became a professor at Padua, the person in charge of executions was actually a friend of his, so Vesalius could even go in and observe the living prisoners who were waiting execution and say, I want that one, I want that one, and, and then the person would be executed. According to Dr. Bilabil, Vesalius was determined to pass on the first-hand knowledge that he had gained from his skillful dissections by writing a book on human anatomy. The result was his De Humani Corporis Fabrica, on the structure of the human body. First published in 1538, Fabrica is considered one of the greatest books in medical literature. It's regarded as one of the greatest discoveries in medicine because it contains the first accurate description of the interior of the human body. This was the first major challenge to the authority of the ancient Greek physicians. The book had a great sale that must have been to a wealthy, literate public that went far beyond the medical profession. And the pictures are very elaborately keyed in with the written text, so it just made knowledge of human anatomy much more accessible. Thanks to Vesalius, the study of human anatomy through dissection became an essential component of medical training and helped lead to our next great discovery. The human heart, a muscle the size of a fist, beating more than 100,000 times a day, over two billion heartbeats by the time you turn 70, pumping more than five gallons of blood a minute. Blood flows through the body, traveling a complex highway of arteries and veins. It's estimated that if all the blood vessels in just one human body were placed in a line, they'd reach some 60,000 miles, more than twice around the Earth. But in the early part of the 17th century, how blood works in the body was misunderstood. The prevailing theory was that it ebbed and flowed through the heart by way of pores in the soft tissue. Among those who believed in this theory was an English physician named William Harvey. He was fascinated with the workings of the heart. The more he studied the beating hearts of animals on his dissecting table, the more he realized the accepted theory of blood flow couldn't be right. Quite explicitly, he says, I began to think whether the blood might have a motion, as it were, in a circle. And then he begins a new paragraph, and he says, and this I afterward found to be true. In his dissections, Harvey observed that the heart had one-way valves that kept the blood flowing in one direction. Some valves let the blood in, while others let it out. Here was his great discovery. The heart, he realized, was pumping blood into the arteries, where it then circulated through the veins, coming full circle back into the heart, ready to start the cycle all over again. Today, it's obvious that blood circulates in the human body. But in the 17th century, William Harvey's discovery was revolutionary. This was really striking at the very core of traditional medical ideas. And at the end of his treatise, Harvey says, when I think of the countless implications that this will have for medicine, I see a field of almost unlimited possibilities. Harvey's discovery led to major advances in anatomical research and surgery, and simple, life-saving ones, too. 
In operating rooms and trauma centers around the world, surgical clamps are used to stem the flow of blood and keep a patient's circulation intact. A simple device, but each one a reminder of William Harvey's great discovery. Another great discovery having to do with blood occurred in Vienna in 1900. There was a great enthusiasm throughout Europe for transfusing blood. And at first there were claims that this had marvelous therapeutic effects, but this was followed within months by reports of people who died. Why did some blood transfusions work and others didn't? An Austrian physician named Karl Landsteiner was determined to find the answer. He mixed blood samples from various individuals and studied the effects. In some cases, the samples mixed safely. But in other combinations, the blood clumped and became sticky. On closer examination, Lonsteiner found that clumping occurred when certain proteins called antibodies in the recipient's blood bonded to other proteins called antigens on the donor's red blood cells. For Lonsteiner, this was the moment of discovery. He realized that not all human blood was the same. He determined that human blood could be divided into four distinct groups. He called these blood groups A, B, AB, and O. He realized that blood transfusion could only be carried out safely when people receive blood from someone who shared the same blood group. The impact of Lonsteiner's discovery was immediate. Within a few years, blood transfusions were being practiced around the world, saving countless lives. By the 1950s, accurate blood typing helped make organ transplants possible. Today, in the United States alone, Blood transfusions are performed about once every three seconds. Without them, it's estimated that four and a half million Americans would die each year. While the first great discoveries about human anatomy enabled physicians to save more lives, there was little they could do to reduce pain. Without anesthesia, Surgery was a waking nightmare. Patients were held down or lashed to a table. Surgeons worked as quickly as possible. The sooner the torment was over, the better. In 1811, one woman wrote of the ordeal. When the dreadful steel was plunged in, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, nerves, I needed no injunction not to restrain my cries. I began a scream that lasted during the whole time. So excruciating was the agony. Surgery was a last resort. Many people simply chose to die rather than to have the surgeon cut into them with his knife. According to Dr. Hardin, for centuries, various remedies were used to help ease pain during surgery. Some like opium or an extract from the mandrake root were narcotics. By the 1840s, several individuals were on the trail of finding a more effective anesthetic. In Boston, two dentists, Horace Wells and William Morton, both of whom knew each other, and in Georgia, a small town doctor named Crawford Long. They experimented with two chemicals thought to have the potential for reducing pain, nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, and ether, a liquid mix of alcohol and sulfuric acid. Just who discovered anesthesia is still a matter of debate. All three doctors claimed it. One of the first public demonstrations of anesthesia occurred on October 16th, 1846. William Morton had been experimenting with ether for months, trying to find a dosage that would enable a patient to undergo surgery pain-free. With a special device of his own creation, he convened a demonstration before an audience of Boston surgeons and medical students. He administered ether to a patient who was about to have a tumor removed from his neck. Morton waited. 
The surgeon made the first incision. Remarkably, the patient did not cry out. After the surgery, the patient reported feeling nothing throughout the entire operation, and word quickly spread. Surgical pain was conquered. Anesthesia had been discovered. Despite the discovery, many people were reluctant to use anesthesia. Some religions believed that pain was to be tolerated, not relieved, especially during childbirth. Queen Victoria played a role in this. In 1853, she was giving birth to Prince Leopold, and she asked for and was given chloroform and found that it relieved the pain of childbirth. And shortly thereafter, women in general said, I think I'll have chloroform too. If it's good enough for the queen, it's good enough for me. It's also impossible to imagine life without our next great discovery. Imagine surgery without first being able to see where to make the incision which bone may be broken, where the bullet may be lodged, or what pathological condition may exist. The ability to see inside the human body without cutting it open was a turning point in the history of medicine. To find out more about it, I paid a visit to Betty Ann holtzman Kevlis, a professor of history at Yale University. At the end of the 19th century, people were using electricity, but they didn't understand what it was. This is a tube, which I believe is a copy of the one made by the Siemens Company, which was the one that would have been used by a Röntgen. Röntgen was German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen. In 1895, he was experimenting with a cathode ray tube, an evacuated glass cylinder, a vacuum tube. Röntgen marveled at the glow created by the rays coming from the tube. For one of his experiments, Röntgen enclosed the tube in black cardboard and darkened the room. Then he turned on the tube. Moments later, something startled him. A photographic plate in his lab was glowing. So he realized that something very unusual was going on, and he knew that the, whatever the ray that was coming out of here was not a cathode ray. He also discovered that it didn't respond to magnetism. Mm -hmm. He couldn't deflect it the way you could cathode rays. It was something altogether new, and he called it X for unknown. Like uh, in algebra. Absolutely. Röntgen had accidentally discovered a radiation unknown to science, which he called X-rays. After having been rather mysterious for several weeks, he called his wife down. He said, Bertha, let me show you what I'm doing because uh, no one's going to believe this. And he had her put her hand under the ray, and he took an image of her hand. 